these things. So today we want to move on to a very important uh, topic of the book of Proverbs. It's probably the most important one because it talks to you and me directly and it calls us the righteous. And uh, the righteous is actually appearing 130 times in the book of uh, Proverbs. So that means it's really important. And uh, not only the term righteous, but right, upright, uh, uh, and these same things. And that is not counting the comparison with other groups of people that are not called uh, righteous by forsake, but they are the, the righteous, they are the good people, they are the people of integrity, they are the blameless, they are the, you know, these kind of things. So uh, they are the generous people. And you have all the, also the contrasting expressions that are related or, or contrasted with the righteous uh, that we have a long, long list of that. Um, the lazy, the angry, the cheater, the liar, the devious. So it's really about the way of life. How are we going to live? The book of Proverbs is really the most practical book of the Old Testament. Amen. So what does that mean to be righteous? Uh, who are the righteous? How do they live? And what benefits do you get from living uprightly and things like this? So there are three... Uh, first of all, the, the word for um, uh, righteous in the book of Proverbs is, uh, and the Old Testament is the word uh, tzedek. Like we talk about the Lord or justice, Yehovah, uh, uh, tzedek. Uh, that means just, justice, lawful, upright, uh, righteous, and many other synonyms like blameless, innocent, uh, integrity, honesty, all of these things. So it's a very wide word. And to simplify it and make it clear to us this morning, I want to simplify it in the slide number two into three main applications of the word righteous uh, in, in the Old Testament and in the Bible. Uh, is the three kind of justice or applications. Judicial righteousness, which is concern with men, um, being equal before the law. It's the law that regulates justice. And the law comes from God. So all men are equal and facing uh, the law. So righteous, like we, we, we see sometimes uh, God is just. Uh, sometimes you want justice because you have been treated unfairly. Uh, sometimes uh, you want the, the evil person to be punished because he deserves something, he's, he's been hurting a lot of people. So we're talking about the concept of justice. We're talking about judicial righteousness. There's another one. Imagine if there is a, if there's not a just law, what will happen? If the judge will change its ruling according to how he feels, or he will change his ruling according to who stands before him how much money they have in their pocket. So you need a law that is just. So judicial uh, righteousness relates to that concept. The second one is ethical righteousness. It's concerned with the, the conduct of men with one another, how we relate <coughs> to one another. Um, we want to do what's right. We want to be upright. We want to be good. We want to be honest and are dealing with people. That is ethical righteousness. <clears throat> That's what we are going to talk mainly about in the book of Proverbs. Then we talk about theocratic righteousness, which is concerned with man and God and his relationship and his, and his either fear or desire or love uh, to relate to the Lord, to please the Lord. Uh, go to slide number three. In Proverbs 17, 15, we see the one who acquits the guilty and the one who condemns the righteous, both of them are in abomination to the Lord. So we see that this uh, uh, includes most of what we have said uh, this morning already. The way we live and the way we relate to people matters to God. That's what the book of Proverbs wants to tell us to, to, this morning. The way you live, the way you conduct your business, the way you speak, 
the way you treat people, it matters to God. It's not just like uh, questions of uh, human beings to human beings, but it, it matters to God. It's, the book of Proverbs tells us so much about that, and we will see many scriptures about it this morning. And also, it has great consequences that we will see this morning listed in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs deals mainly with ethical righteousness, which concer concerns the, the, the conduct of men with men, as I said previously. Go to uh, slide number four. In Proverbs, we need to connect three important concepts. The first one is the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord here uh, is the strong desire, longing in the heart of man to be right with God, to, to seek what is pleasing to him. You have the fear of God. It keeps you straight. It gives you discernment. Actually, we, we studied some of that already in the first message on Proverbs. It, it leads you to wisdom. It's the beginning of wisdom. If you click, you will see the outcome of the fear of the Lord. Uh, the outcome of seeking to please God brings wisdom. It's the beginning of wisdom. It brings wisdom into your life to discern what's right, what's wrong. It brings warning to your life. It gives you the way to go and things like that. And the result, if you click and one more time, the result is that the righteous, you and me, we are made and able to uh, decide to live uprightly. We have the strength, we, we have the, the, the will to, to live uprightly. So in order to interpret uh, correctly the book of Proverbs, we need to remember something else that is very important. We are in the Old Testament. So the word righteous or the concept of righteousness includes people doing good. Uh, people who are honest. And these people are living under the law of the Old Testament. We are still in Proverbs, we are still in the Old Testament. So don't confuse the term righteous this morning with the concept that we have from the New Testament, with through the, the, the righteousness that we receive from Christ, which, which is also part of it. But this morning we're going to talk about a lot about the upright, up, living uprightly, living in a way that is pleasing to the Lord. We're going to begin this morning with uh, the righteous that is being bold as a lion. Go to the next slide. And we read this text in Proverbs 28, verse 1. The wicked person flees when there is no one pursuing, but the righteous are bold as a lion. How do you feel this morning? <clears throat> do you feel bold? Do you feel bold as a lion? Can you roar? <laughs> Actually, you need to feel like that because that's how the Bible calls you. The righteous, the, the people who love God, the people who are following after the Lord, the people who are seeking for wisdom, you stand bold as a lion. That's, that's who you are. That's, that's who I am this morning. That's very important. Did you know that you can be bold as a lion? That's what the scriptures is telling us. Do you see yourself as bold? If you think of yourself, do you see yourself as a bold person? It depends on the aspect, of course. Sometimes we are a bit bold in certain aspects of our life, but we are timid in other, in other ways. What does it mean to be bold as a lion uh, in relation to the uh, righteous? How can you live bold? Look first at the wicked person that we have here, the wicked person. And we remove an misunderstanding here. It says, the wicked person flees. So that, that, does that mean that all wicked person are not bold? Because you see all over the headlines, you see it in your office, you see there's a lot of bold people, bold uh, unrighteous people. They are bold in their recklessness. They are bold in their insults and they're bold in their offensive ways sometimes. They are bold in their, in their selfishness and their greed. People can be bold uh, in this way. So let's remove that. The wicked are often bold in their recklessness. But here, we want to give a, uh, an image of the insecurity of the guilty conscience of a wicked person. 
that at some point in their heart, they have a, their, their guilt conscience will reach out to them. Not always. Sometimes they may look very bold and very assured of themselves and their wickedness. But there will come a time where they will not feel so sure about, about that. And it will create in their, in their mind an imagery of a pursuer that is not there. Uh, for example, you have a, a child and he's supposed to do his homework. But mom and dad are not home and he's watching something or he's playing uh, computer games. And, but at the same time, he, he's, he's thinking and being careful to watch for the door and for any noise that will indicate that the mom and dad are coming. So there's a bit of the picture like this. There's a, you, you can do your wrong things, but at the same time you are aware that it is wrong and you are imagining a pursuer. If someone will come and maybe punish you and catch you uh, in this way. So, so here we want to see that uh, the, the, the guilty conscious will find that he is suspicious sometimes of other people. Okay, if you cheat people, you will be also afraid of being cheated by someone else. That's an application of that. Um, if you tell lies to people, and then, then you f see that person, and then you don't remember the lies you told them. <laughs> you will be a bit uncomfortable like that. Or if you did something wrong with the law, you broke the law, and then uh, you see a, a police car uh, following after you, uh, maybe you think, is, are, are they after me? So th there's a bit of, the, of that image over here, this, en this unsafe and secure feelings that you may be caught for the things that you have done that is wrong. And we want to contrast it with the righteous that is bold. That's the contrast that we want, that we will find always the, throughout the book of, uh, of Proverbs, always this contrast that, we, we, that reinforces. And the word bold here is really confident. It's safe, it's solid, it's, it's firm, it's sure of, of themselves. In First John it says, if our conscience does not condemn us, we are bold toward God. We have confidence before God. So we have nothing in our conscience that is wrong because we are seeking for wisdom. We have the fear of the Lord. We are walking with God. We are the righteous. We don't have uh, the image of a pursuer. We don't have this fear that somebody will catch us doing wrong because we're not doing wrong. We're doing what is right. So we stand, we stand strong. We stand strong in our relationship with people, husbands and wives. We stand strong. We stand strong in our testimony at work. And we stand strong before God as well. The righteous has a clear conscience. The righteous are bold as a lion. What is there about a lion that we need to see in our lives that makes us stand bold as a lion? The lion is the king of beasts. The lion is not afraid. He will defend his ground. The lion, when he is hungry, knows that he is strong, that he can run fast. He knows who he is, and he knows he is the king of animals, and he knows he can jump on the gazelle and have his lunch ready. The lion knows about himself. He is full of confidence. What about us as believers? Do you know who you are in Christ? Do you know where you stand? Do you know why you have to live in a certain way? Because you love Christ and all this. But boldness is something very much lacking in many Christians today. Many Christians are just afraid. Just afraid. They do not act like lions, certainly. They are scared sometimes to even identify themselves as Christians. And that is not right. Because the Bible tells us really that we should be a people of confidence. We should be a people that stand bold as lions. Say amen if you believe that. Amen. amen. So we're going to look a little deeper in the life of the righteous this morning and find out how we can be bold as lions this morning. And why we should be. The righteous and his integrity. The next slide. A righteous man who walks in his integrity, how blessed are his children after him. There are so many good Proverbs. There are so many. You know, I was telling you that the, the Proverbs about the righteous 
uh, about 130 uh, direct mentions in the book of Proverbs. So of course, I'm not going to list them all this morning, but it's to tell you the importance of the topic to, for your life this morning. Righteous and integrity are inseparable. You don't see one without seeing the other. The man who walks and his integrity. Here is a person that walks his life, that uh, sort out his life and makes his decisions, makes his choice to decide how he's going to stand in his life. And he is striving to do what's right. He's striving to be honest and to live according to God's standards. It's not going to be easy. Because opportunity to compromise, opportunity to cheat, opportunity to, to lie, to obtain a benefit will always be before us. But the one who walk in the fear of the Lord always will win. You will always win something more. Even if you would lose some material benefit or lose something, you will be winner at, at the end of all of this. Integrity means completeness, innocence. I remember when I was a young boy, the instructions of my mom, I was thinking about that when I was reading on the righteousness. My mom really did instruct me. Because when I, be, I didn't have a dad at home, and I started very young to lean toward evil, to go to steal and to try something and try to drink and hang out with the, 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 the wrong influence in my little village where I grew up. And my mom was instructing me, and she was warning me, and she was telling me, if I get in trouble, if I ever get in prison, you know what my mom told me? She will leave me in prison, and I will have to learn to, you know, pay for what I have done wrong. And I remember these, these wise advice of my mom, though she was very loving and very kind and very funny, but she was warning me, a little boy, you better live your life correctly. And the lifestyle of parents here has a very great effect on, on, on children. Here, if the parents are people of integrity, what an example it is what, to, to give them a solidity in their life. The children will enjoy a blessing. The good reputations of, of, of the parents, the simple and happy lifestyle of the parent will reflect on them. When I was raising my children, uh, I wanted them to understand uh, something about God. And I was telling them, uh, you might not realize it now, but I want to tell you that you are blessed because I am a righteous man. You are blessed because mom and dad, we are righteous before God, and God bless our life. So by blessing our life, He is blessing your life. And I want you to know that when you will go to school and the success that you will have and when you will look for a job and you will get a job and when you go to university and you will be accepted to university, these are outflow of the blessing that God has given to us as righteous that overflow over you. Do you understand that? I wanted my children to understand that concept. Because, you know, they could take for granted that they just apply for a job, get a job, get a university, get this, get that, make money. Because they started to earn money early by teaching English. Because they were foreigners living in Hong Kong. So they were, they, 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 they were considered like, you know, uh, to, to be hired and uh, make money. So I wanted them to understand that all of this blessing comes from your parents blessing, bringing blessing over your life because God is blessing the righteous. Do you understand what I'm saying? And I believe this is true. Proverbs 12, 3, no one can establish true, no one can be established through wickedness, but the root of the righteous will not be moved. And again, we see uh, the root. The root is a picture of, of solidity, of security, firmly planted. The godly have uh, deep roots. Even when things do not go well for the righteous. Things don't always go well for the righteous. Eh? But his honesty and his integrity will remain even if it costs him something. Even if things go, uh, go fall apart in his life. Proverbs 16, 8. Better to have a little with righteousness than to have abundant and come without justice. And that is so true. Here we are contrasting two sets of things. The first contrast is the income. 
we are contrasting a large income and a, a very modest income. But the most important contrast in this verse is not the income. It's the fact of having justice and integrity and not having justice uh, in the house, in the life, and the, in the relationship of that person. And you find in this scripture also one of the better sayings. You know, the book of Proverbs is filled with expression, better this than that. It's filled with, with that, and this is one of them. The first is better than the second. It doesn't condemn wealth. It doesn't condemn that uh, you can have abundant income. Not at all. That's not the point. Because blessing and prosperity are part also of the blessing and the benefits of living righteous. So we're not condemning it. We are comparing uh, principles of life. We are comparing things that are better, things that will do you good, things that will lead you somewhere, things that builds up your life, things that builds up your family, things that will keep you to live peacefully, happily, and, and, you, and your life. Uh, other, other text says, a little with the fear of the Lord is better than abundant wealth with turmoil. And the word turmoil here it comes with anxiety. So if all this cheating and all the fighting and all the going to court and all the, the fighting with the siblings about the inheritance of the lands and, you know, like all of these things, uh, it, it, will, it will lead you to some, something. You can fight, you can win the wealth, but you will lose, what will you lose? You will lose so much. You will lose your brothers and sisters. You will lose uh, your husband. You will lose your wife. You will lose so much more. You will lose your reputations in all of this. Another text says, um, a poor person with integrity is better than a rich person that has perverse way. And that, that is repeated in many, many ways throughout the book of, of Proverbs. But here we want to say again that not all wealth has turmoil, turmoil coming with it because sometimes this wealth comes from the blessing of the Lord. But it is if this wealth comes from injustice and with perverse ways, it will lead to something. It, it, there will be a price to pay somewhere along, along the way. Maybe take time or whatever. And the righteous, when he is knocked down, he does not stay down. Proverbs 24, 16, for a righteous man falls seven times. And again, we have a text here that says that the, the righteous is not immune from the difficulties, the calamities of life. If there is a typhoon, if there is a flood, if there is a, you know, an economic crisis in the land, or there is a different situation, the righteous, we are going through that. But we are going through that with the Lord. We are going through that with our integrity. We are get, getting through that with our good reputation, with peace in our hearts. We, we, we don't have to add this as a, as, as a turmoil to our life. Amen? Amen? Praise God. He will get up again. Let's go to the next slide. The righteous is kind and generous. The righteous care for the needs of their animals. How many animal lovers in here in this room this morning? Raise your hands. So you have a very good text here for you this morning. God speaks to you and he encourages you and he is slapping on the shoulder. Yeah, you love your animals, you're taking care of it. It's uh, the righteous as regard for the life of his animal. Let's go to the next one. <laughs> <laughs> Proverbs 21. All day long the lazy craves greedily. And all they do is they think what they would like to have in their life. The righteous, however, gives without holding back. He is generous. He loves to give generously. We are talking about a lazy person here, a sluggard. So all day he's dreaming. He's dreaming about getting things. He's craving. He's jealous. He's looking at the neighbors and he is speaking against the neighbors who have something that he doesn't have. But he is not going to do anything to get it because it's too hard. 
He's not going to save his money. He's not going to go to work. He's not going to, you know, do these things. He's just going to covet greedily, the, uh, the King James says about this. But the generous here, and the other words, he gives without holding back. And here we have also a concept of being content. He's content. The righteous is content with what he has. So giving is not a problem. I, I think this is very important uh, uh, topic to, to think about this morning. Because for many in this room, maybe giving is a problem. Is that right? Because when you give, you become poor. If you give 10%, you only get 90% left. Okay? So giving is a problem. Because what you have is yours until you give it. But the righteous here thinks different. The righteous is content. The righteous is satisfied. The righteous is thankful because what he has is received it from the Lord. The Lord has blessed his life, has given him strength to work, has given him an income, has given him a good mind, can save his money. So he's okay with that. He's content. And there's a contrast here. The lazy is greedy. He wants more. He's dreaming about more. The righteous is not greedy. He's content with what he has. So to give something, he's okay with that. He's okay. And the expression does not hold back, emphasize that the righteous gives freely without fearing, listen to that, without fearing that generosity will bring him to poverty. Generosity does not lead to poverty. That is something we need to learn by faith, by trusting God, by acknowledging that he, he owns everything, He owns my life, He owns my resources, He owns my health, He's blessing me with whatever. I'm a manager, I, I'm, I'm, I'm using what He has brought into my life. Please say amen to that. Believe it, because it's true what I'm saying you. We need to cultivate a culture of generosity. Because this is what we learn from God. This God loves that attitude over here. The righteous, however, in contrast to the lazy, he gives without holding back. You know the story of Ananias and Sapphira? They gave generously. They gave very generously, but they held back. They held back. Why? They could have held it back, but declared it, not pretending, not being hypocrites. They held back because their relationship with God was not right. They didn't have the fear of the Lord. Oh, that is a great example. If you want to understand what is the fear of the Lord, look at Ananias and Sapphira. You will have a negative example. They did not have the fear of the Lord. They gave. They, w they pretended that they were generous. In a way, they were generous. They gave something, but they held back. And that is not pleasing to the Lord. The righteous, because of his fear of the Lord, because of being content with what he has, don't hold back. Proverbs 13, 25. The righteous, oh, I love this one, heeds to the satisfying of his soul. Wow. The righteous has enough to satisfy his appetite. Does that mean that the righteous has super abundant? When it says that he eats to the satisfying of his soul. I, I come from a very modest family. My mother was a hairdresser and she had three children and she was a widow, uh, not a widow, but uh, my, my father de departed a lot from, from us a long time ago. And uh, we were poor. And I knew my mother was an expert. She could cook a meal with just a few left over. She was, you know, doing hair of a woman in the living room because she used our living room to you do know, the hair of people. And then she would rush in the kitchen, open the fridge, find a few left over, and we had a meal. And we were satisfied with that. So we didn't have to have, a, you know, the best of the best and the and thing. So... 
here in this text, it's not about the abundance of wealth, that we are satisfied, the satisfying of the soul, or as enough to satisfy his appetite, depending on the Bible version you are. But it's about being content. It's about being satisfied and thankful again here. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. The greedy never has enough. Yeah. You see, there's a difference. Even if you have abundance, it will not be abundant. How much is enough? How much is abundant? You may have a lot, and it's not a lot to you. And you may have a little and be very satisfied with that. Amen. Hallelujah. Are we on the same page? Yes. yes. Okay, just a few of you. I've lost some of you already. <laughs> okay, Proverbs 13, 21. The righteous is very careful with his wealth. Are you careful with your wealth? Are you a good manager of your money or something? Trouble follows sinners everywhere. Actually, I'm not speaking on, on, on money or wealth. I'm talking about uh, uh, state of mind, peace, security. I'm talking about freedom. I'm talking about, you know, uh, living right. Trouble follows sinners everywhere, but righteous people will be rewarded with good things. Hey, that's really good. The righteous people will be rewarded with good things. So we will see that verse a little bit later. And then it says, good people will have wealth to leave to their grandchildren. Isn't that wonderful? That you will end up having. No, I want to tell you a story. I, I, felt, I think you, many of you will like it. Because as I was preparing this, this uh, study, I remembered some of my neighbors in my hometown. Okay, I need to give you a bit of background. I come from a very small agricultural town in the province of Quebec. It's all Catholic, it's all white, it's all French speaking, it's like this little place. There's no tourist place, there's nothing interesting, there's no hill, there's no monument, there's nothing, it's just a boring place, okay? <coughs> That's where I come from. <laughs> but, at, at one point, we had one Chinese family as neighbors. There was only one Chinese family in our, in our town. There was not two, not three, there was only one. Because before, there had been a Chinese restaurant in our little town. And that family had immigrated from Guangdong province and came there. And the name of the lady was Mrs. Lai. And she didn't speak English, French. But I, I realized this week or the two weeks ago <coughs> how blessed I have been by this family. I didn't realize it then but I realized it later because in 1989 I came to Hong Kong for the first time to with a ministry to carry uh, Bibles into China and uh, when I came to Hong Kong the first time I couldn't speak English, uh, Chinese and uh, that's the first time in my life that I was in a country where I couldn't speak the language because I already spoke three languages. I've been to Mexico, Guatemala, United States, uh, in Canada I could speak, I could hear, but in Hong Kong I could not. And that has been such a shock. So when I returned home, I, I went to the public library with my family uh, to borrow books, and then there was this book, Chinese Express. And then the voice of God told me, take this book, I will help you. Like really a strong conviction, but I says, how am I going to do that? I remembered that I had Chinese neighbors in the past, <laughs> Mrs. Lai. So I went to Mrs. Lai's home, because we had moved to another place, knock at the door with the book, and I says, hi, Mrs. Lai, you teach me <laughs> like this. And Mrs. Lai has been very, very kind. Every Tuesday afternoon, I brought my little mini recorder, and I went to her place with my book, Chinese Express, and she was very kind. She tried to taught, teach me Cantonese, and, uh, but the book was to learn Mandarin, so it didn't <laughs> really work well. But anyway, she was kind. And one day, she told me, she pointed to the book, and she, she says, Pack in, pack in, no good, no good. I says, wow, this lady, she doesn't like Beijing. 
But no, that's not what she meant. She meant, this book is not good. I'm Cantonese speaker. This book is Mandarin. So how can I teach you? So that's a pack in, pack in, no good, no good. So anyway, she has been very good to teach me. And, okay, now I, I'm out of the subject. I'm coming back to the subject. Back to the subject, her husband, one time, and her, came to our home, and he gave me financial advice. You see? He gave me financial advice, and that was very simple. He says, you should save your money, even if you save a little bit. It will benefit to you in the long run. It will give some interest and all this. Is, is, is there a better, a better advice than that? So I just thought about Mrs. Lai and her husband when I was preparing this, how this couple have blessed my life. Because I still remember the advice of the husband, and I have put it in practice in my life. And I have gained some income from little, little savings, because we were poor. We had four children, but God has given us increase. And uh, I want to thank the Lord for Ms. Ms. Mrs. Lai and her husband, because also, I, I realized it a bit later, this couple were the only Chinese family in my little hometown, in my boring hometown, but they have done so much to influence me, so that I am here living in Hong Kong for almost 27 years. And I have uh, benefited from their influence and from their friendship and their openness to, uh, to my life. Wow, praise the Lord, amen, amen. So anyway, uh, we are back into our subject. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Lai, uh, and actually it's probably not Mr. Lai, I don't even know his family name, Mrs. Lai, and uh, her husband have given me good financial advice. And today I have some wealth to leave to my grandchildren. Go to the next slide. What time is it? Time to finish, eh? almost. I will not finish my sermon today. Even though some of the benefits may seem that sometimes we do it on our own. You know, sometimes you, you gain and you, you prosper and you, you, things go well for you financially. And you may think that it is you. Uh, you've been very wise, you got a good job, uh, you studied hard, and you've done it all, and all this. Uh, you deserve the slap on the shoulder, but remember that God is the one that gives you the reward. Uh, Proverbs 10, 16, the wage of the righteous leads to life. There's a wage, or actually the word wage here is the, f the fruit of the work, the deed the salary, but it's also the reward and the recompense of, of that. So it's really the, if we want to read it differently, the reward which the righteous receive from his work earnings. That's what it means here. So we're talking to the righteous. The righteous goes to work. The righteous earn his money. The righteous manage his money. And God reward the righteous with a, a, a profit, with a gain. His life goes well. So my question to, to many of us this morning here, how do you manage your money? Are you good manager? Because it says the, the reward of the righteous. The righteous lives and manages money well. How do you manage your money? But not only your money. How do you manage your salary? How do you manage your future based on your income? How do you manage your health, which is part of your uh, uh, reward, uh, your life? If you get rich but you don't have a good health, it's useless. So you have to, how do you prepare the years of savings that you need for your future? I believe that many of you sisters this morning and uh, we need to learn how to manage money here. Because there's a link between conduct, management, and reward, and the consequences of that. The rewards will be determined by the moral choice. Wh whatever you decide to do, you will determine the, the amount of the rewards you will get. What one receives in life depends on what uh, you use uh, and what you get. What you got from the Lord is up to you to choose how to use it. And how, how you choose to use it will bring a reward. 
will bring a consequence into, into your life. Amen? Hallelujah. So let me skip the other two scriptures because it talk about uh, uh, snares. The transgressions of an evil person is a snare. And, and Proverbs 11, 6, <coughs> the faithless <coughs> will be captured by their own desire. So there's a, there's a slavery, there's, there's a place, a trap. There is an ensnarement in, uh, in, in this place here, a snare. But if you look at the righteous, he sings and rejoices. He doesn't have a problem to sleep at night. He doesn't have worries. He has peace of heart. And the upright, uh, his righteousness will deliver, deliver them. Amen. Proverb eleven eighteen. I think we will finish with that. Because after that we are going, we have more sections about the Lord blesses, the, how the Lord blesses the home of the righteous. That will be next time. And also the greatest benefits of the righteous that will be to be able to go to the Lord in prayer and what the Lord likes and what the Lord detests. We will see that in the, in the, next, in the next time. So we will finish with 11.18 today here. The wicked earns deceptive wages, but one who sows righteousness gets a sure a reward. Or evil people get rich for the moment, like a quick. It just goes so well. But the reward of the godly will, will last, if we want to see that. And I think we, we understand that very, very quickly. We, we know about uh, the stock market and the investments and, you know, the being cheated, losing money, earning money quick and trying to, to cheat. I remember a few years ago, I was walking through Hong Kong a Park, a Kowloon Park. And there was a young uh, asylum seeker that uh, uh, had been part of Lighthouse here. And, uh, uh, but I had heard that he has done something wrong. So uh, I, I was waiting for him to bring corrections or to rebuke him. But I did not see him. So that day when I walked through the Hong Kong par uh, Kowloon Park, he was there. He was standing there, but he didn't, he didn't see me come. And he was there with a bunch, bunch of bad guys, a lot of bad guys. And in one hand, he had a big beer. And in the other hand, he had the US dollars. And he was very young. I think he was 22 or 24 years old. And he, he left his country and he thought uh, going to Hong Kong and or maybe I can go to Europe and you know I, I can uh, improve my life and things like that. But he ended up in Kowloon Park with a big beer on the one hand and the US dollar in the other hand and he was with a bunch of really bad guys. So I was thinking, okay, what, what do I do? Do I just uh, wait to see him later or do I talk to him now? So I said, no, I better talk to him now. So I walk around and I came to face to face with him and all of his bad guys' friends. <laughs> and I said, oh, hi. So that is what you've done last night. What dirty things did you do last night to, to earn these uh, uh, US dollars and things like that? I says, come on, you are 22 years old. That's what you want to do. You want to end up in prison. You want to waste your, the future of your life and things. So to get some US dollar, what did he do? Quick, to get it quick sell something, steal something, uh, uh, deal with some something, I don't know. But the people who were there were looking at me and he says, oh, pastor, <laughs> yeah. So it's not going to last and it's not going to be the reward we're talking about here. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Be assured, an evil person will not go unpunished but the offspring of the righteous will be delivered. So don't worry about that. We're happy today, amen? amen. We are bold as lions, is it? Yes. Are you bold as lion? Yes, yes I, I feel I am bold like lion. I feel so much blessed. I feel so secure. I feel so happy in my life. Oh, God is so good. Amen, amen. 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 Hallelujah. I want to skip to one more verse before I finish <laughs> because that's really good. I go to the slide number nine and go to verse 
So, okay, click, click, click a few times. I, I don't, don't know why I've done that, this one, this way. Okay, fifth. I think you went too far. No, you didn't go too far. I didn't go far enough. Uh, I'm looking for 15.6. Yeah, I saw it. I saw it. Yeah. <laughs> Finally. In the house of the righteous, what do you find in the house of the righteous? Wow, it's good, isn't it? How many wants that? Yeah. Raise your hands. Raise your hands. Yes, yes. We want that. Okay. But the income of the wicked brings trouble. Okay. We're talking about wealth here. And the word abundant wealth is riches, strength, and treasure. It's an accumulation. But a few years ago, we did a, a class here in Lighthouse about manage your finance and uh, with Larry Burkett. And we learned what is wealth. Is wealth only money? No. no. Money is so much, wealth is so much more than, than money. Uh, it could be a, a land. It could be a, a house. It can be materials. A lot of the wealth has to do with materials. But it's very much more than that. The word treasure is part of the definition of wealth. I want to ask you this morning, if you think of your household, your home, what would you consider that is a treasure in your home? Your washing machine? <laughs> or your wife? <laughs> or maybe she's the same, the washing machine, <laughs> and the wife is the same person? Yeah, anyway, just a joke, forget it. Okay. Maybe <laughs> erase the tape. <laughs> I did not see that. Uh, I was sick this week. <laughs> okay. The wealth that we have is what we treasure, what has value in our life, and is so much more. If I think in my house, my treasure is here. I don't care about the rest. When I think of wealth, I think of my children. I think of what God has done in my life. And I'm deeply moved. Because I see so much wealth in my life, but I cannot count it in the bank. There's this also, the Lord has increased and the Lord has blessed me. But what is precious, what is considered as a treasure in my life? And to you, righteous, who lives with God this morning, and the house, and your family, there should be an abundance of this kind of treasure, the things that are really, that counts, the, the things that God is blessing you with, the things that makes you happy, the things that makes your life meaningful and rich and, you know, good and that you like, that you keep you going on, that, you know, you understand what I'm saying, huh? Yes. So I'm so thankful to God because good people are rich in many ways. And we have great treasures in our house. Amen? Amen. And that makes me bold this morning. Praise the Lord. Would you please stand? I'm sorry I went a bit long. Hallelujah. Father God, this morning we want to just stand before you, examine our standing with you. There's so much more to talk about the righteous and how to become righteous. And there is hope also for the unrighteous this morning and people who fail before God. Because Jesus, you died on the cross to make us righteous, truly, to make us right before God to give us an inheritance, an eternal inheritance. You enrich our life, Lord. Your principles, the principles and the wisdom of your word enrich our lives, gives us peace and confidence and stand firm 
It doesn't mean that everything will always go smooth and easy. We will have price to pay. We will go through adversities. But we are going through that with you, Lord. And we, we stand bold as lions this morning. There's no question for us this morning, looking at all these scriptures, that it is extremely important to God that we walk in righteousness. Thank you, Lord. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. We sang it this morning. The righteous run into it and is safe. Everyone in this room this morning, I'm sure, desire a life that is blessed by the Lord. We desire a loving home. We desire blessed relationship. We desire success. We desire sufficient wealth to satisfy material and emotional needs. It's all here in the book of Proverbs. And it's called the righteous. Thank you, Lord. I stand before you as your righteous one, blessed. And the boldness of the believer is also part of our walk. We need boldness in the way we live to do the things that the Father expects us to do. So what kind of believer are you going to be this morning? A bold one or a fearless one? Remember that you have boldness already in Christ. So stand up and manifest your boldness for the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God